Okay, hello everyone. So this is uh, my talk on benchmarking review that I gave at RubyConf in San Diego, I don't know, about two weeks ago, something like that. Um, my talk did take exactly 45 minutes at RubyConf, so I'm going to try and go at least somewhat speedily, make sure I don't go grossly over time. So let's talk a little bit about benchmarking. And when I talk about benchmarking, I do not mean talking about benchmarking the Ruby implementations themselves or the frameworks that we commonly use. This is not a talk about which is faster web framework to be using. If that's the sort of thing that you're interested in, there's a lot of content on the internet already to help you make good choices, including isrubyfastyet.com and a really great blog post by Made by Market called the Ruby Web Benchmark Report. So instead, what I'm going to be talking about today is how you can be benchmarking your Ruby code. I'm going to be talking a lot about the common pitfalls that a lot of people might encounter when trying to benchmark their Ruby code, uh, how you can tell when that might be happening to your benchmark, and how you can try and address it or fix it uh, so that you're actually measuring what you think you're measuring. And not only that, I really want to make it clear that benchmarking can actually be kind of fun, and it's not a terribly boring thing, and can it be pretty entertaining and interesting to learn about your code in a new and different way. So the first question really is why should you benchmark? And to answer that question, I'll ask another question, which is why do you write tests? Uh, and really, tests in, our, uh, in programming is all about knowing the certainty in functionality. Your tests guarantee that your code is going to function in a particular way. So back to the question, why should you benchmark? Benchmarking is about certainty in performance, in knowing how your code is going to perform across various inputs or in various situations. And this is important to learn about your code, but it's not just about your code. It's also about uh, the code that you're relying on, the other gems in your system. And it's all about the Ruby language itself. Learning how the internals of Ruby perform can also give you a better understanding about how you should be structuring your code and using this language. So, how to benchmark Ruby code. I need to drink water. I'm also obsessively afraid of spilling all over my laptop. <laughs> okay, so here's the first code example. And this is using uh, the standard benchmark library, require benchmark, and we're trying to benchmark the performance of uh, finding the element in a particular spot within an array and also to find the index of a particular element in an array. So here I am initializing our array that we're going to be benchmarking. In this case, it's just uh, the array of 0 to 10,000 integers. And so to create the benchmark, inside the benchmark, you're going to create what's called reports. And this is what is, you're actually testing. And so you, you name the report something that's going to be descriptive to you as to what you're testing. In this case, at and index, the two methods. And then inside, you're going to, the block, you write the code that you're actually going to be testing. And so th at this point, we are testing array at and array index. And we're passing in a random integer within the size bounds to get a you know, good representation of the various performance aspects depending on what value we're asking of it. And so the result that you're going to get from this looks like this. And uh, you know, it's, uh, you're basically just getting the actual runtime of the code that it was taken to run. So what are the pros of the benchmark gem? It's really easy. It was a pretty small amount of code that I had to write to get that benchmark. It's also in the standard library. You don't have to do anything. You just get it for free. Require a benchmark and start going. So but there are some cons with uh, this particular benchmarking tool. There's a lot of variable fiddling. You can see I had a couple of different variables, including the number of times I was uh, iterating the block inside each report and the size variable that was kind of being passed around. The output is kind of difficult to read. You're basically this table of numbers, and you kind of have to, it's up to you to kind of figure out what that means and how to compare the different uh, benchmarks that you've created. And then, in my opinion, there's a lot of boilerplate, boilerplate required in order to write these benchmarks. And, you know, to give an example of this, if we look back at our code, you can see here that uh, it's required that I created this n variable and then write 
n times inside that report block. And the, the reason for that is that sometimes the code runs so fast that you're not going to measure it appreciably if you run it once. So in this case, we're running it 100,000 times to measure the, to actually get a number that shows up on our report. And so uh, there's another gem that kind of takes, uh, takes the, these pitfalls and tries to make it better. So here is the same code, same benchmark, written using benchmark IPS. And what benchmark IPS does is it's trying, instead of measuring the amount of time it takes to run those blocks, instead we're measuring the iterations per second that those uh, blocks run in. And that's how we can remove that n variable. We don't have to do that n times anymore. IPS takes care of that for us. And that's a really great benefit. And you can see that it's pretty much exactly the same. And we also get this cool compare option down at the bottom, which I'll talk about. So let's go, the output is a little bit more complicated. So let's go walk through it. At the top, uh, it runs through this pre-calculation phase where it kind of preps and primes the, uh, and tries to measure exactly how many iterations it should be running. And this allows it to be a little bit more accurate over time. Then uh, down below, this is the actual results of the benchmark itself. And so you can see here that at ran at over 3 million iterations per second, where index ran at 41. Uh, 41,000 iterations per second. Then down below, since I add that compare block, it's going to automatically compare for you and tell you how much faster or slower they are running against each other. So you can see a little bit how the performance differs. So mainly when you're looking at this, this is probably where you're going to really want to be glancing at first to get the results that you're looking for. And then here you can see the, the comparison report. So what are some of the pros of benchmark IPS? Uh, it's a lot less fiddly. You don't have to create that n variable and try and, you know, I run this 10,000 times or 100,000 times or a million times. Um, the other cool thing about it is that the numbers in benchmark IPS is the bigger is better. You're looking for a higher iterations per second. And so that fits in a little bit well with our brain and how we measure performance. Uh, where it's a little easier to, to say, oh, this runs at, you know, 100,000 iterations per second and this one runs at a million iterations per second million is better. Now the pro is it's pretty much the exact same syntax as uh, the regular benchmark gem, so you don't really have to learn anything new. And we have that cool compare feature. So what are some of the cons of the benchmark IPS gem? It is a separate gem that you have to install in order to start playing around with it. And the other main con that I uh, have with the benchmark IPS gem is that it really only provides you a snapshot view. And so uh, to explain what I mean. This is the, that benchmark that we ran against the array when the array size is 10,000. And this is the exact same benchmark when the array is a size is 100,000. And so we can see here that that comparison is sending back different information about how much faster or more performant one method is from another uh, depending on the size of the object that we're testing it on. And so going back to our um, code, so this is the, the, the code that I'm focusing on, on adjusting. This is the size that we were changing in those previous examples. And so uh, there's also another gem called Benchmark Big O, and it does a couple things a little bit differently. And the idea here is that it's going to be measuring your benchmark across different sizes. Try and calculate how the performance uh, changes as the object grows itself. And so... Um, in this case, uh, you need to tell it how to generate the object that it's testing. And right now, um, uh, at the top here, I'm going to say I just want to generate an array. And this is equivalent to this block where I'm creating this generator that knows how to generate array objects. And this generator is exactly the same as that array that we've been testing on our previous benchmarks. So the other main difference from the previous benchmark tools is that uh, now that array and size, they're not globals anymore. Uh, we've consumed that into the generator. And since those are values going to be changing as the benchmark does tests on different sized objects, we need a way to pass that, those variables down into the block. And so now the report passes both the object that need, is going to be tested and the size of that object down into that block for further use. 
The other things that are different is that there is a charting option to provide an HTML chart of the results. And there's also a way to output the uh, chart on the terminal called termplot. And so what this is doing is basically running benchmark IPS on a wide range of different sized objects. So you can see here it's running it on at of size, you know, array of size 100, 200, 300, so on and so forth. But that's not really the interesting part. This is kind of, I think, the more interesting part about benchmark big O, in that it's providing a chart of the performance over time, over the size of the array as the array changes. And so now we can see why that benchmark IPS gave us those differing comparison results when we change the size of the array. At is a constant time lookup, because you're giving it the index of the object that you're trying to look up, whereas trying to find the index involves searching. And searching, as we know, is um, n log n. And so here is also the example of the terminal plot that is output, which I think is super rad. <laughs> so pros. Uh, Benchmark Big O is really, really good when you have a range, uh, something that's, o that's being tested over a range of different input sizes. There's also charts, which are pretty cool, and ASCII charts. <laughs> By the way, I wrote that gem, so that's why I'm so excited about it. I did not create the ASCII chart thing. That's GNU plot under the covers, but I was really excited to find it. So some cons. Uh, it is also a separate gem. And it also takes a lot longer to run. Uh, by default, it tries to gather uh, points across 10 different sizes. And so that means that uh, by default, it's going to run probably about 10 times longer than other benchmarking uh, tools. And sometimes that can kind of suck. The other thing is it's not always applicable to every use case. And Benchmark Big O obviously requires you to be able to change the size of the object that you're testing. And in some cases, that's just not applicable to what you're doing at all. And so if that's the case, don't use that gem. So now that we've talked about a couple different ways to benchmark, now we're going to talk about how to benchmark effectively, also known as avoid making these common mistakes. So at RubyConf, um, Jeremy Evans gave a talk on one of his new projects, and one of the quotes he made in the talk was, benchmarks are useless without reproduction and critique, which I thought was very accurate. And so uh, in the spirit of both benchmark uh, reproduction and critique, there is a GitHub repo with all of the, both the examples I just, just showed about how to, to benchmark using the different gems and these different uh, example pitfall cases that I'm going to talk about. So if you're interested, take a look there. So the first question that you really need to ask yourself is, is your environment consistent? And so um, here's a you know, really simple little benchmark on um, trying to what's the performance if I use just a regular sort versus if on this array of users. And so this is pretty simple. Um, have a user model, giving it some sort of random name. And then I'm just trying to sort that based on the name in two different ways. And this is the result that I get if I have 7,000 Chrome tabs open, if I'm streaming Netflix, listening to Pandora and SoundCloud and a bunch of other things on my computer. And you can see that that's probably not what you would be expecting as a performance uh, metric for, uh, for this, this test. And the problem is, is that I was not keeping my environment consistent. Performance obviously depends on the CPU cycles of your computer. And if your computer is busy doing other things, that's going to screw with your results. If, you, if I changed my computer to, to not be doing all this other stuff, then I'm going to be getting something that's a lot more reasonable and a lot more smoothed out. And so that's uh, you know, one good thing to remember. And sometimes you don't really know about that one Chrome tab hidden far away that's like playing some ad video that you didn't want to listen to and you know, watch. You know, that can really affect things depending on your environment. The, in giving this example, I'll also talk about the compare function of benchmark big O. Uh, and so when you want to give it the compare function, it generates a couple other charts that can be really useful for you. This is the array sort report, and it's, uh, the benchmark big O gem has calculated a couple other example data sets that would fit some of this data if it was, at, if it was performing on different levels in, of O notation, right? So big O. 
So we can see the constant and log n way at the bottom. The blue is what it would be if it was an n line. The yellow is the n log n line. And the, the red, the first one, is the array sort, the actual data that we collected. And so this is kind of cool to see that, in fact, array sort is n log n, which is what we would ex ex expect for a sorting algorithm. And so this is, can be, um, you know, this is obviously, we know the answer going in that sorting is n log n, but to s be able to test this against code that you're written to see is it linear or is it n log n, this can be a helpful tool. And we can see that sort by is also n log n, even though sort by was performing um, better than sort, there's still n log n algorithms at the end of the day. So next. Are you verifying the behavior in your benchmarks? And to answer this question, the answer can be you can always write tests for your benchmark itself. And so here is a, uh, you know, a really simple example of what I mean by that. So I have these two methods, test A and test B, and I'm writing a benchmark to report each one. And so now I can create uh, a test file that tests the behavior that I'm expecting from test A and test B. And also the other thing that we'll talk about a little bit more in the future as well is to test the mutability of those results as well. And um, Aaron Patterson provided this fine quote at Keep Ruby Weird. And so I'm taking his advice at heart and I'm gonna give you a little bit bigger of an example by using the Fibonacci sequence. So this is the test that I've come up with to test my Fibonacci method. So I've you know, written out the first couple uh, Fibonacci sequences, and then I'm just going to test each of these with index to assert that the um, answer that I'm expecting from that array of Fibonacci numbers is what I get when passing my Fib method, the integer that I'm going to be passing in. And then, as I suggested as good practice, I'm also testing the mutability, that if I call Fib5 twice, I'm going to get the same number. It's not going to just randomly give me some other Fibonacci that's not the one I'm expecting. And so if I was then, you know, quickly writing my benchmark and, uh, you know, I was, I was researching both the Fibonacci sequence and the factorial at the same time, and so I kind of made a slight mistake in defining my Fibonacci. Then um, on the right, you can see the output of the chart, which, you know, it's spiking upwards. We know the Fibonacci sequence takes a lot of resources, so it looks great. I might have just said, you know, that's the result and be done with it. But now I can see that my tests are failing, uh, that the Fibonacci is not actually, method that I've defined is not actually uh, returning the actual Fibonacci number. So I can go back and fix that to the correct Fibonacci uh, definition. And now I can see a very different chart where I can see this strong polynomial curve, which is how the, uh, the Fibonacci sequence actually performs, which is a lot different than that, you know, that linear line that we saw before. And now my tests pass. So now I know that the results that I'm getting are uh, actually, I'm testing what I really want to test. Uh, this also highlights a couple other ways to fiddle with the data that you need to fiddle with when writing your benchmarks. Uh, because the Fibonacci sequence is such a highly polynomial curve, I can't even like calculate the Fibonacci of too large of a number. It stack overflows, Ruby, you don't want to get too, too stack level too deep errors. So I want to just test Fibonacci from 5 to 24. And so I have the options to configure exactly the sizes that I want to test. And here is the final chart from the Fibonacci sequence that I saw. Um, you know, where you can see if, uh, this is also kind of important to fiddle around with the range of variables. If I had stuck with just, you know, 5 to 10, maybe I wouldn't have realized how, how much of a cost that this method is. And I probably don't want to deploy this particular implementation of the Fibonacci sequence into production. So next, we're going to ask ourselves, are we only modifying one thing? So here is a benchmark using benchmark IPS about uh, how to compare using uh, the reduce method on uh, an array or, uh, uh, versus the each with object method. And so, you know, each one um, you know, is basically doing the same sort of action on an object and returning a result. And if I ran this benchmark, this is what I would get. I would get a result that reduce was 3,000 times slower 
than each with object. And does anyone believe that that's actually the case? Like what, right? So let's look at, let's look at that benchmark again. Uh, so the way that reduce and each with object work is slightly different. Um, reduce uses the result of the block to pass on to the next iteration. And so in this case, uh, since we're trying to uh, uh, accumulate this in the hash itself, we need to return the hash. And so by adding, using merge is a one-liner for adding something and then returning the entire hash. Whereas uh, each with object, by definition, always stores that initial object that it's collecting and runs the block against that same object every single time. So it doesn't matter what the block returns. And so we can use a simple assignment. And this is really the problem with this benchmark, is that I'm not modifying only one thing. I'm modifying two things. I'm modifying the reduce and the each with object and the merge versus the array assignment. And that's what's causing this behavior to be unexpected. And if you think that this doesn't actually happen, my friend was complaining about the performance of reduce on Twitter um, because of what he was doing inside of his benchmark and trying to test this. And this is a very smart, very accomplished Rubyist. It's easy to do. So instead, um, uh, I'm going to kind of compare, like, why, why does this performance different? Why does using merge versus a direct array assignment matter? So let's write a benchmark to test this. And so I've created a generator that kind of just creates some random hashes with has with a, an integer to a string. And um, I'm going to compare hash merge with direct assignment. And this is what we see, that the performance of those two different methods is very, very different. Direct assignment is a constant operator, whereas merge is a linear operator. And that's really where we got into trouble. Um, because if we write the reduce benchmark the correct way and use hash assignment and then return that hash for a whole extra line in my benchmark, if we compare that against you know, the benchmark with the merge, what we see is the reduce with the merge inside of it was stacking an uh, on algorithm inside of another on algorithm for an n squared result. And that's where you can get into trouble. Don't do n squared things. So what's our next uh, question we're going to ask ourselves? Are you accidentally mutating your objects? And this is something that can affect um, well, pretty much all of these basic benchmarking things if you're not handling it yourself, which is the mutation of the objects. Uh, both benchmark IPS, you know, it's running that block. It doesn't care what you do to the objects within that block. It's going to run it over and over again. Same with benchmark big O. So I want to, I am curious about uh, the delete versus delete if methods on array. And so I might write a benchmark to test uh, how uh, deleting half of the things in an array in these two different ways might work. Um, and so in this case, um, for, for delete, since I want to delete the first half of the objects, I'm just going to go from 0 to size divided by 2 and iterate over those and just delete every single one. Whereas delete if takes a block, I can just ask it, is this element less than size divided by 2? If so, delete it. And so this is the result that I get. And the Sometimes the tricky parts with mutating objects is that this chart doesn't look wrong. This chart looks very close to correct. It's showing the same uh, overall appearance of what I would actually expect. And so this might be something that, that I, you know, you take a look at this, it's, it's what you expect and you're going to move on. But the problem is, is, that, uh, is that those benchmarks, it's deleting the objects in the array. So it's going to delete it the first time and then pass the array with now half of its objects missing to the blocks every single subsequent time. And those uh, methods aren't going to have to, aren't actually doing any deleting in those cases. And that's probably not what I meant by that benchmark. Uh, so now I'm going to take the previous delete if report and just copy it straight over from the previous benchmark and then uh, add the, uh, uh, I'm going to duplicate the array and see what the difference is between um, unintentionally mutating that object and doing the correct thing and duplicating the array and deleting it that way. And this brings me to another aside, which is when you're doing things like this, it's also pretty important to set controls. So now I'm adding extra work in that other benchmark, and I want to know if that's going to be affecting my results or not. 
So I'm going to add a third report, which is just to measure the, the effect of that dupe on that object. Uh, is this causing, you know, is this going to skew my results of my other benchmark a lot, or is it negligible? So here are my results. Uh, the array.dupe we can see down at the very bottom is the red. It's a constant operator, so we can see like that's not really affecting anything, so I don't have to worry about it. So my control worked. So now we can see the difference in behavior of the delete if, which is the purple, and the dupe and delete if, which is the green. And that's the actual performance of delete if in most cases. And you can see that, that it's, it's a slower operator. You, I mean, it makes sense. Actually deleting things is, takes more time than not deleting them. Uh, so uh, this had an effect on that previous benchmark. I wasn't actually measuring the thing that I thought I was measuring. And if I was using that timing for something, trying to base conclusions off of it, I would have been basing it off of the wrong thing. And for completeness, here is the same comparison off of the delete rather than delete if. And you can see that it's a little bit more curved. It's, if you really care, delete if is better than delete. Keep on using. So next, are you using random effectively? So um, here I'm going to be using, creating a different type of generator. And um, it's, it's uh, well, I'm using the generator object uh, method to create an array. And I'm going to be shuffling that array. And I'm just going to uh, run a report off of uh, that shuffled array where I'm just going to try and find the middle point of that array. That's probably not what you expect, right? <laughs> What's happening? This doesn't seem right at all. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that that size over 2 is a deterministic value and include is a short circuit operator. And so um, I'm running, you know, for each of these reports, it's running it over and over again, but with that same constant deterministic number. And depending on the, um, how the generated object was generated, because um, there's only one array for each size that's generated. Otherwise, you don't want to even know what would happen to the memory on your computer. Um, the, so depending on for which size, where that object landed in the shuffled array, in some objects it might be to the to the front, and so then it's going to perform really quickly. And other sizes, it might be towards the back, and that's going to be perform differently. And so that's, you can see here, you can basically guess where in the array that size over two had happened to land in that shuffle. So how do I fix that? Um, in the report, you know, using randomization in your report is very important, probably more important than using it in the generator. So here is the, you know, I've replaced that deterministic value with a random value. And now I get the result that I'm expecting. And so, um, you know, to do a little bit of test, let's do something else. So um, I'm going to now create an array that's not shuffled. Uh, this is a, uh, an array just straight from one to size. And I'm going to run three reports on it. I'm going to see uh, how does the performance of finding the first object in the array. That's going to be the deterministic best case, right? And then I'm going to try and find the last item in the array. That's going to be the deterministic worst case. And then I'm going to use RAND to find uh, what's the performance of finding an uh, average item in this array. And this is the sort of uh, result that you're going to get from this case. Uh, in, you know, the in best case includes going to be constant. It's pretty easy to find the first item in an array. And then uh, the purple you can see is the worst case. And the cool thing about running a benchmark like this is that now you have basically the cone of performance, right? This is uh, the shaded line underneath that purple curve. That's, that's, that's how the array include could possibly perform under a variety of different uh, use cases. And, and knowing that information, uh, knowing that it's constant on the bottom and linear, could be important to know. Or is it linear and linear? Or is it linear and polynomial? That could be interesting to know. And so being able to um, know what you're testing. Are you testing best case? Are you testing average case? Are you testing worst case? That can be really important. And so for this example, um, you know, I've given a lot of examples of testing Ruby internals. Because in putting together examples, it's easy. Because I don't have to teach you what array include does. You already know that. But earlier I said that you can be using uh, benchmarking to test the behavior of the code that you write. And so for this example, I'm going to uh, 
run a benchmark on a tool called Terraformer that the Esri PDX office, the office that I work for right across the street, has built, which is uh, a, geo a geometric toolkit for dealing with geometry, geography, and formats. And in particular, uh, the Terraformer gem allows you to calculate what's known as a convex hull of a variety of different objects. Could be, uh, and so to give you pictures are worth a thousand words. So um, this is what I mean. This blue line string is a random walk line string of points on the earth that we can see here starting in Portland and wandering over past Tigard and down into Oregon City. The convex hull of this random walk is that purple polygon, this convex polygon. And so uh, calculating a convex hull can be really useful in a lot of use cases. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can watch my uh, talk that I gave at um, Cascadia Ruby earlier this year, which I talk much more in detail about this algorithm. But I won't now, because we're already 30 minutes in. Uh, so the, there's a couple different algorithms that you can use to implement the convex hull. And the first algorithm that we implemented was an algorithm called Jarvis March. It's really easy to find. It's really easy to implement. Uh, it, unfortunately, is not the fastest algorithm. And uh, we were noticing that it was performing very unreliably. Sometimes it would r run pretty fast, and sometimes it would take forever. And so, uh, you know, we had to, we had, uh, wanted to find out if there, you know, there had to be a better way. Uh, this is not really a fun thing to have to do. So we found another algorithm called monotone chain, which performs much speedier. And we could have called it like an end of the day, you know, we implemented the monotone chain, you know, did some like, te like some simple tests, saw that the test suite sped up a bunch, and we're like, could have just been like, great, ship it, we're done. Um, but I was a little bit curious about like, you know, how much faster, in what cases is it faster? So the thing about Jarvis March is that um, by knowing the implementation of the algorithm, we can uh, know what the best case or worst case of that algorithm is. And the thing about Jarvis March is it's slower when uh, more of the points in the object that we're calculating the convex hull for, more of those points are actually on the convex hull. And so the definition of a worst case in that case is a circle, right? So the points that define uh, approximation of a circle, if you take the convex hull of that, all of those points are going to be on the convex hull. So, um, which is different than the random walk, which is like the picture I showed, which is going to be standing in for our average case. So I created a couple of methods to generate these objects. That's what Benchmark Big O needs to work. It needs to be able to generate the objects. Uh, and so I use you know, Terraformer here. So the, line, the random walk it starts in Portland, mutates the lat long a little bit for each step, adds it into an array until, until it's of the right size. The circle um, uses the terraformer circle method to generate a circle, which has to have at least three points in it because that's not a circle at all if it's two points. Um, so for this case, I'm also showing how you might be able to run, to run a benchmark with a dynamic generator. Uh, so in this case, I want the generator for the, for the benchmark big O uh, benchmark to be able to generate a couple different objects. And so um, I've created, uh, so I, I have those method names of random walk and monotone, and it just calls those methods based on uh, a generator name variable that I've defined. And then for convenience, uh, setting the convex hull implementation is not very uh, small in length. So I've created a simple convex hull uh, helper method to easily run the convex hull algorithm on a particular object with a particular implementation. Ah, so this is the longest and most complex benchmark I will show you. Uh, so now I, here's the actual benchmark code. I'm passing in that dynamic generator to the generator object of the benchmark. I, um, convex hull also takes a really long time, so I'm going to up the sample time and run, uh, by default, both IPS and Big O run each test for five seconds. I'm going to bump it up to 20 seconds for each case. Fiddle with the sizes a little bit. Um, charting it out as terraformer.html, and the reports are here. So in the first block, I want to test the random walk. So I'm going to test um, Jarvis March on the random walk and the monotone chain on the random walk. And then I'm going to set the generator to the circle and test the Jarvis March with the circle 
and Monta and Chain with Circle. Whew, that's a lot of code. Let's see what we got. So this is the result. And we can see there pretty much, you know, can't even see all the other ones, but you can see that the Jarvis March uh, running on the circle performs pretty terribly. Um, so it's, uh, you know, pretty much uh, an n squared algorithm. Uh, and it's completely overpowering all of the other use cases. So uh, let's zoom in a little bit to see if we can see all the others. Whoop, whoop, zoomed in. So now we can see the Jarvis march on a random walk performed much, much better. And in this case, it's back to linear. And uh, whereas the monotone, uh, the monotone chain perform, you can basically can't even see in this chart the two lines. I'm going to zoom in again a little bit more. Boom. And so now we can see that the monotone chain algorithm, not only did it perform better than Jarvis March on both of those test cases, but it performed pretty much identically depending on uh, what object was thrown at it. And so that's really the benefit of monotone chain. It's very stable in how it performs across different input types. And if I had just tested the, if I just benchmarked the Jarvis March on, a, on an average case, I would have thought, hmm, you know, monotone chain isn't like, you know, that much better. I mean, they're still both linear, right? Uh, it's not that much better than monotone chain, or uh, worse than monotone chain. Uh, only when trying out the worst case scenario do I really see how bad Jarvis Marsh could perform. And so this is, hmm? Marcus, do you have a question? Oh, what's the worst case of monotone chain? Um, it is, um, or did you, did you check that against the uh, Yeah, I did. So this was, Monotone chain is well renowned for being stable across all input types as one of its benefits. So it doesn't, it's, um, it's really based on, uh, uh, it will perform in this sort of linear, I think it's uh, technically an n log n algorithm, but it will perform the same, depending on, on the number of points in the initial data set. Doesn't care how they're organized. Okay, so I showed a lot of code, and so now we're on to the conclusions. Um, the, the biggest take home that I want everyone to, to really pay attention to is to verify the assumptions that you're making about the code that you're benchmarking. Benchmarking can be really great to be able to learn more about your code and other people's code. Um, and it also to learn about Ruby itself. And, you know, I hope that not only did you learn a couple different things to pay attention to when you're benchmarking, but I'm hoping that you may have learned something new about the Ruby language that you didn't know before as well. So when to use the benchmark gem? Just use benchmark IPS. There's no real benefit to using the benchmark gem that comes in standard library uh, rather than benchmark IPS. Uh, just go straight to benchmark IPS. So when should be using benchmark IPS? You know, this is a gem that can be used really all the time to do small spot checks of your code. If you're, you know, you have a question about performance, like how many times have you come across a comment in your co in the code base? It's like I'm using, you know, this method over that method because it's faster. And you know, is it really? Uh, Aaron Patterson gave a really awesome talk at Madison Ruby like a couple years ago. Uh, there was an entire talk based on one comment in Rails that was basically like, we're, using, we're doing this here in this method because of this reason and that reason. And instead of just being like, oh, okay, that's good, and moving on, he tested it. And he actually verified that, in fact, both of those things were false statements. And so that he could do ex basically exactly what the comment said not to do for performance reasons in order to speed up that code base. And so this is really about verifying the assumptions Spot checking your code, and you can uh, benchmark IPS is really easy to set up really quick benchmarks, run them really quickly, get the results. And it can also be used for more expansive analysis too, if you want to set up something a lot more complicated or run a bunch of, uh, across a bunch of different test cases. So when should you use the benchmark Big O gem? Really, it's best used if the input or the thing that you're testing has a range of sizes. And a good test for this is, can you envision a chart that you might want to get out of your benchmark? If you can envision a chart of the like that I've displayed many of to you today, then that probably means that there's a range of inputs that you can be
be using against your data, and you just have to figure out what that is. And it has to be okay if it takes a while, uh, because again, uh, you're testing on a lot more different data points in order to collect this information, and doing benchmarking does take a lot of time. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, while you know I just talked a lot about how benchmarking is the best thing ever, you can also take it too far, and um, you know, really, benchmarking should be used as a tool in your tool belt in order to help you become a better, more knowledgeable programmer about your own code and about uh, other code that you work with. And using, knowing when to use it uh, can be a great benefit, but you can also take it to the extreme where you're wasting all your time measuring things that aren't really that important to your day-to-day -day job. So at the end of the day, it's really, you know, when is this valuable to you and when is this a tool that you can use? So if you are curious for more, uh, Eric Michaels Ober gave a really amazing talk with really beautiful slides at Baruco entitled Writing Fast Ruby. And in fact, a couple of the examples that I stole for this were kind of drawn out of inspiration from this talk. And um, it was really well done, really beautiful, and it helps show you how to do simple things to speed up your Ruby code in substantial ways. Uh, then Juanito Fatas turned all the examples from this talk into uh, a repo. So you can play around with these, uh, the benchmarks that Eric talks about. And other people have also expanded in and added additional benchmarks of uh, common Ruby things as well. And it's pretty fun to kind of look around and, and see how people are writing uh, effective benchmarks for a lot of different components within the Ruby language. If you are more Rails focused, since I gave this talk at RubyConf, I tried to avoid talking about Rails too much. But a lot of us are Rails developers. And um, Richard Schneeman wrote this, uh, recently wrote this interesting gem called the Derailed Benchmarks, which uh, help you ben do a bunch of different benchmarks for your Rails apps. And the really takeaway take from this README is it adds a bunch of different rate tasks to do um, some quick tests on a couple, a lot of different performance metrics on a Rails code base. Uh, and this can be fun to test on your code base itself, but it also provides you a really great code base to go look and see how, you know, how, how do they determine how much RAM usage is taking over time. And well, there's a code base to look at. And finally, I could not put together beautiful code presentations without the noun project. So thank you, thank you designers for putting all of those fine, beautiful things on the internet for me to use. And I'm done at 42 minutes. Woo! <laughs>